Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing receptor tyrosine kinase. Okay, uh, so uh, we've now discussed um, seven families of receptor tyrosine kinases. Six of the families that we've discussed consist of these tyrosine kinase receptors, uh, which, when they're ligand bind uh, to them, what happens is that they dimerize with another receptor. Okay, and then you get this trans autophosphorylation where initially the tyrosine kinase domains, which are on the cytoplasmic side of the uh, membrane, uh, they phosphorylate each other. This results in their activation, and then they phosphorylate the residues uh, outside of the tyrosine kinase domains. So you get a lot of these phosphotyrosine residues appearing on the cytoplasmic side of the receptor. Okay, right. Uh, we then also saw the insulin family of the receptor tyrosine kinases, which are already dimerized, and when the ligand uh, binds to these receptors, what will happen is you'll get the uh, tyrosine kinase domains brought closer together. You'll then get trans autophosphorylation, where the tyrosine kinase domain number one here will phosphorylate tyrosine kinase domain number two, and tyrosine kinase domain number two will reciprocate the tyrosine kinase kinase domain number one. Okay, that will activate these two tyrosine kinase domains, and they'll then phosphorylate tyrosine residues on each other's cytoplasmic tail. Okay, right. Uh, so again, you get these phosphotyrosine residues. Now, in the case of the insulin receptor, you also get the docking of this insulin receptor substrate protein 1 via a phosphotyrosine binding domain onto uh, a phosphotyrosine residue, and then the tyrosine residues in the insulin receptor substrate 1 protein are then phosphorylated by the tyrosine kinase domains to create an amplification of the number of available phosphotyrosine tyrosine residues. Okay, what we now want to discuss is which pathways are going to be activated by the appearance of these phosphotyrosine residues. So, we've now got many phosphotyrosine residues exposed on the cytoplasmic side of our receptor. We want to see which downstream pathways are going to be activated by these phosphotyrosine residues. Okay, and the pathway that I'm going to start off with involves RAS. Okay, then what I want to talk about is the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway, and then finally I want to talk about phospholipase C gamma enzymes. Okay, right, so we're going to start off then with uh, RAS, uh, the RAS pathway. Okay, right, uh, so let's redraw out our generic receptor tyrosine kinase now, and we'll assume that our receptor tyrosine kinase is not one of these insulin family receptor tyrosine kinases, and therefore does need to dimerize when the ligand binds. Okay, so let's just draw this out. So here we have our ligand binding domain. Here's our membrane spanning alpha helix. Okay, here's our tyrosine kinase domain, and then here is our carboxylic acid terminus. Okay, and now this receptor is dimerized with another uh, receptor tyrosine kinase that at the very least needs to be in the same family uh, of receptor tyrosine kinases as it, uh, or even better, more likely, uh, they'll be identical receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay, so both of these have ligand bounds to their ligand binding domain here. So let's add a little bit of color here. So these orange portions here, these are the dimerized ligand binding domains here. Okay, so I'll label those up as ligand binding domains. Uh, then in blue, here we have the ligand bound to the ligand binding domain. Okay, so this is ligand. Uh, then I'll color the membrane spanning alpha helix in red. Okay, so here we have our membrane spanning alpha helices. And then we have our tyrosine kinase domains intracellularly. Okay, and these have been brought nice and close together now, and what will happen is they'll now trans autophosphorylate each other. Okay, so uh, number one here, let's call that tyrosine kinase domain on receptor number one, and then this one can be uh, tyrosine kinase domain on the receptor tyrosine kinase number two. The tyrosine kinase domain on receptor tyrosine kinase number one will phosphorylate the tyrosine kinase domain on receptor number two. Okay. 
and number uh, the tyrosine kinase domain on receptor tyrosine kinase number two will reciprocate and phosphorylate the tyrosine kinase domain on receptor tyrosine kinase number one, like so. And now what you're going to get is activation of these two tyrosine kinase domains, and now they'll phosphorylate other residues that are around the tyrosine kinase domain. Okay, so tyrosine kinase domain number one here will phosphorylate many different tyrosines on uh, receptor tyrosine kinase number two here. Okay, so here are these phosphate groups that have been added onto tyrosine residues, and similarly, um, tyrosine kinase domain on receptor tyrosine kinase number two will phosphorylate tyrosines on the cytoplasmic tail of receptor tyrosine kinase number one. Okay, so here they are. Right, now what's going to happen is we're going to recruit proteins onto these phosphotyrosine residues which have either SH2 domains, SARC homology 2 domains, or phosphotyrosine binding domains, PTB domains. Okay, so let's start this off then. So, we're going to firstly discuss the RAS pathway, okay, which will lead to the activation of uh, the MAP kinase. Okay, so often, rather than calling it the RAS pathway, people will often call this uh, the MAP kinase ERK pathway. Okay, and we'll see why it's called that later on. This is going to be a key uh, enzyme, uh, or family of enzymes, rather, within this pathway. Okay, right. Uh, so, but... People will also call it the RAS pathway because it involves the monomeric G protein RAS, and we'll come back to this guy in a moment. Okay, so it doesn't start with RAS, however, it starts with a protein which is going to bind to a phosphotyrosine residue within uh, the uh, dimerized receptor tyrosine kinase here. Okay, so this little domain here that I've got binding to my phosphotyrosine residue, this is going to be an SH2 domain. Okay, so in green there, that's an SH2 domain on this protein. Okay, and now what is this protein going to be? Well, it's going to be growth factor receptor binding protein 2, or GRB2 for short. So this stands for growth factor, okay, that's the G, and then the R is for receptor, and then the B is for binding protein. Okay, so this is the growth factor receptor binding protein 2 or GRB2. Right, and I'll colour in uh, the GRB2 in yellow here. Okay, so um, this protein will bind via an SH2 domain to the phosphotyrosine residues on the underside of receptor tyrosine kinases. And this occurs for most receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay, you do have to bear in mind that this SH2 domain won't just bind to any old phosphotyrosine residue. It looks at more than just the phosphotyrosine residue. It will need to have the correct surroundings as well. So you need to have a phosphotyrosine residue with the correct surroundings structures as well, okay? Um, but many different receptor tyrosine kinases are capable of activating this MAP kinase ERK pathway. Okay, right, so the SH2 domain will bind to the phosphotyrosine residue, uh, and that has now got this GRB2 anchored at the um, receptor tyrosine kinase dimer here now. Okay, now, uh, GRB2 actually has another important domain. Okay, and I'll put this on here. So I'm giving GRB2 a little extension, basically, that I forgot to put in in the initial drawing of it. Okay, so it's got this little extension now added on. And this domain is going to be called an SH3 domain. Okay, so once again, this stands for SARC Homology Domain 3. Okay, and it's a structure that you have in a huge number of different proteins. You find it all over the place. It was originally found in this protein SARC, uh, but since it's been found in many other proteins, and that's why it's called SARC homology domain. It's a domain that is homologous to a domain that you have in SARC. Okay, right. Now, what are SH3 domains famous for doing? Well, they're famous for binding to proteins in proline-rich regions. Okay, so the next protein that's going to bind to this SH3 domain is going to have within it a proline-rich region. So this little box that I'm uh, 
outlined here and are now colouring in in purple. This is going to be a proline rich region. Okay, so it's going to contain a lot of proline amino acids. So let me just remind you of the structure of a proline amino acid. So once again, I'll draw this as though it's within a protein. So I'll draw it as a residue. So here's the amino group. Okay, and that, there's the bond uh, connecting it to the carboxylic acid group of the amino acid prior to it. Then we have our alpha carbon here with a hydrogen coming off. Then we have our carboxylic acid group here, so that's the core amino acid structure. Okay, now uh, I've made one little mistake here because proline is an unusual amino acid in that it doesn't actually have a hydrogen coming off that nitrogen. Okay, so cross this out. And that's because the R group is actually going to be a ring uh, that connects this carbon, the alpha carbon, to the nitrogen. Okay, so what we're going to have is three methylene groups here, one, two, and then a third one over here, like so. So uh, these are three methylene groups, so each of these is a carbon with two hydrogens coming off, and then you've got them forming a ring like so. And this then is the R group of proline. Okay, right, so in this proline-rich region you have a huge number of these proline amino acids, basically, and SH3 domains are capable of binding to these proline-rich regions. Okay, right, so what, what is the name of this protein then that contains uh, this proline-rich region? Well, it's a protein known as SOS. Okay, and SOS stands for, what does this stand for? This stands for Son of Sevenness. Okay, now it was originally found in developmental biology, and developmental biologists love ridiculous names. Uh, so that's how it came to uh, be given such a silly name. Um, now, there are different forms of SOS, but for our purposes, we're uh, just going to, uh, they all do pretty much the same thing, so we're just going to uh, refer to it as a SOS, a Son of Sevenless protein. Okay, so here it is in blue. Okay, now what is the SOS protein going to do? Well, it's going to activate the monomeric G protein, RAS. Okay, so now we need to discuss RAS proteins. Okay, and I've actually written RAS exactly where I would want to put RAS, so that's quite helpful. Okay, so RAS is a monomeric G protein that is attached to the underside of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so it's not an integral membrane protein. It is in the cytoplasm, but it dangles off the bottom of the cell membrane. And the reason it can do this is that it's got a lipid moiety attached onto it, which uh, sticks into the underside of the phospholipid bilayer and holds it there. Okay, so let me just discuss this lipid moiety with you. So basically, RAS monomeric G proteins are, are palmitoylated. Okay, so to understand what this means, we need to know what palmitic acid is. Okay, so palmitic acid is the old name for a long chain carboxylic acid that would now be called hexadecanoic acid. Okay, and although hexadecanoic acid is more of a mouthful than palmitic acid, it's a more useful name because it tells us completely and utterly what we're dealing with here. It tells us that we're dealing with a 16 carbon fully saturated carboxylic acid. So here's the carboxylic acid group. Okay, then after that we need 15 more carbons. So uh, 14 of these are going to be in the form of methylene groups. So here's a methylene group. And because I don't want to have to draw 14 methylene groups, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bracket the methylene group that I've drawn here, like so, and I'm going to subscript it 14. And what this means is repeat this structure 14 times, basically. Okay, and then on the end of that, we're going to have one final methyl group. Okay, and that takes us up to 16 carbons. So let's just check this. We've got this one here, number one. Then we've got two all the way up to 15, which is these 14 in the middle here. Okay, so that takes up to the 15th carbon. And then this final one is number 16. Okay, so this is the structure of palmitic acid here. Okay, now it's an extremely hydrophobic molecule because this extremely long tail that you've got here, this is not going to interact at all well with water. Now the reason is uh, that this structure is extremely neutral, whereas water is extremely polar. So let me show you the structure of water. 
So here we have a water molecule, an H2O molecule. And basically, in these bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms, okay, of which we have two, uh, these are single covalent bonds, so there are two electrons within them. One of these electrons comes from the oxygen, okay, so let's say that this one that I'm colouring in in red comes from the oxygen, and another one comes from the hydrogen, this one in blue. Okay, now the question is, do the two electrons that are sitting between the oxygen and the hydrogen, do they sit directly in between the two, or do they sit tilted to one side? Well, to think about this question, let's think about what the forces, the electrons, will be feeling. Basically, uh, the electrons are going to be attracted to the nuclei of the, both the oxygen atom and the hydrogen atom. Okay, so in nuclei, uh, in the nucleus of an atom, you have um, both neutrons and protons. Neutrons have a neutral charge, so they have no charge. Protons have a positive charge. Okay, so overall that means that the nucleus of an atom is positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged here, so they're going to feel an attraction towards the nucleus of the oxygen atom and also the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. Now, the question is, which is stronger, basically? Okay, well, uh, you might say, surely it's the oxygen one, because the oxygen's got more protons within it, so its pull should be greater. But you also have to factor in the fact that shielding the positive charge of the nucleus of the oxygen atom, you have electrons already orbiting around, which have a negative charge. So they will be shielding the positive charge of the nucleus from the these electrons here. So you have to also factor in that fact, uh, whereas the hydrogen nucleus has no more electrons surrounding it, okay? So it doesn't have any of that negative charge that then is repelling these away. However, the oxygen atom still does pull with a greater force than the hydrogen atom. Now there is a fancy word to mean how hard uh, an atom pulls on the electrons in a covalent bond, okay? And this is electro negativity. Okay, so um, we say that oxygen has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen, and what this means is that an oxygen atom will pull on electrons in a covalent bond like this harder than hydrogen will. Okay, so these electrons in a water molecule are going to be pulled towards the oxygen atom, and they're going to sit slightly towards the oxygen atom versus the hydrogen atom. This means that the oxygen atom becomes partially negatively charged, okay, whilst the hydrogen becomes partially positively charged. Now, the same thing is going to happen in this bond, so this hydrogen is also going to become partially positively charged, and this oxygen is going to become even more partially negatively charged here. Okay, so... Basically, water has a, two poles. It has a negative pole and a positive pole. And this is what we mean when we say that water's structure is very polar. Okay, right. Now, this means that water molecules can interact extremely well with other water molecules. So if I draw another water molecule here, here we have another one, okay, and I'll draw some electrons on this oxygen. So this oxygen, not only does it have the two uh, covalent bonds here, but it also has these two lone pairs of electrons. Okay, right. So here is a lone pair of electrons. Now, we also have to remember that this water molecule is polar as well, so this side is going to be partially negatively charged, whilst the two hydrogens are going to be partially positively charged. Now, this setup is going to allow the formation of a very strong intermolecular bond between this water molecule and this water molecule. Okay, so what can happen is this partially positively charged hydrogen here, okay, here in turquoise, uh, this can interact with the partially negatively charged oxygen on the other water molecule. And even better, you have this lone pair of electrons, which is a center of negative charge. So basically, what's going to happen is this um, proton here that's in the nucleus of the hydrogen atom is going to become nicely sort of interacting, where well, it's going to set up a nice interaction with this lone pair of electrons on this partially negatively charged oxygen molecule on this other water molecule, okay? And this very strong form of intermolecular bonding, this is known as hydrogen bonding, or this bond that we've got here is a hydrogen bond, okay? And for an intermolecular bond, hydrogen bonds are strong. Okay, so, water molecules interact extremely nicely with each other. Now, back to palmitic acid. 
Okay, palmitic acid has this extremely long tail here, okay, of 15 carbons. Now, all of the bonds in this tail are bonds between two carbon atoms or bonds between a carbon and a hydrogen atom. Now, when you have two carbon atoms bound to each other, the electronegativity of these two carbon atoms is going to be exactly equal. Okay, uh, so the electrons in this bond between these two carbon atoms are going to sit right in between the two carbon atoms. Okay, so there's going to be no uh, polarity in these bonds between two carbon atoms. Meanwhile, if we look at the bonds between the carbons and the hydrogens, okay, carbon and hydrogen roughly have the same electronegativity. The degree to which they pull on electrons is roughly the same. So again, the electrons sit nicely in between the carbon and the hydrogen atom. Okay, so the message here then is that this structure is extremely neutral. There's no partial positive or partial negative charges. Everything is nicely homogeneous. Now, the problem is when you try and mix he uh, extremely neutral molecules like this, and neutral uh, is, well, uh, neutral and hydrophobic kind of go hand in hand, okay, and we'll see why in a moment. So if you try and mix uh, molecules like this, which are extremely neutral with water, uh, then what you're going to try and do is you're going to try and force these water molecules to interact with the long chain carboxylic acid here, okay? And when you ram a water molecule against this extremely hydrophobic tail, or extremely neutral tail, because we haven't understood the word hydrophobic yet, we'll say it's neutral, extremely neutral tail, it's not going to be able to form very strong interactions with this extremely neutral tail. So, basically, it's not thermodynamically favourable for the water molecules to interact with the, uh, lo the long-chain carboxylic acid molecules. And by the way, these are also called fatty acid molecules. So when you have a long-chain carboxylic acid, which uh, has an extremely long neutral tail here, such as these palmitic acid molecules, uh, they're also called fatty acids. Okay, uh, so, basically... Um, the water molecules would much rather interact with another water molecule than they would interact with uh, the fatty acid molecules. So what will happen generally is that the fat and the water will separate into two different layers. Okay, um, so uh, this is not because the water molecules don't want to interact with the palmitic acid molecules. It's because they would just much rather interact with other water molecules. Okay, they can form much stronger interactions with other water molecules than they can with these um, long chain carboxylic acids. Okay, so that is why uh, long chain carboxylic acids and water molecules don't tend to stay uh, mixed together because the water molecules would just much rather interact with other water molecules. So they tend to aggregate all of the fat molecules together. And I should say that this principle of having a very neutral structure, this is common to all lipid molecules. Now, not all lipid molecules look like this. This is a long chain carboxylic acid or a fatty acid molecule. But the running principle of all lipid molecules or all fat molecules is that they all have extremely neutral structures. And this means that they don't interact well with water molecules and therefore they're also referred to as being hydrophobic. Okay, so basically what tends to happen is if you put um, fat molecules into water, the fat molecules end up all aggregated together. And the reason isn't that the fat molecules interact with each other well, it's that they don't interact with the water molecules well. Okay, and the water molecules interact far better with other water molecules. So the best thing to do on the water molecules front is uh, for all the water molecules to interact with each other. And the way that they can minimize the surface contact between fat molecules and water molecules is for all the fat molecules to end up aggregated together. Okay, so that's why fat molecules aggregate together. Okay, so the idea then is that you are going to take palmitic acid molecules and attach them onto the side of your polypeptide for your RAS protein here. So RAS poly proteins are a single polypeptide and you will attach a palmitic acid molecule to one of the amino acid residues within this RAS polypeptide. Usually it's cysteine residues. Okay, and uh, then what's going to happen is the RAS protein is going to have this 
uh, long tail sticking off the side of it. Now this is not going to interact well with water molecules, so what will end up happening is it will end up pushed into the um, underside of the phospholipid bi there, so it will end up implanted into the inner leaf of the phospholipid bi there, which contains a huge number of other uh, extremely neutral molecules which are therefore hydrophobic. Okay, so that's how monomeric RAS G proteins end up bound to the inner leaf that of the phospholipid bi there. Okay, let's now colour in our RAS protein in orange here. Okay, so they are monomeric G proteins. Now, the uh, feature of G proteins is that they have two states. Okay, so all G proteins have two states. Um, there's the on state, where they have guanosine triphosphate bound to them. And then they, there's the off state, where they have guanosine diphosphate bound to them. Okay, now RAS is an example of a monomeric G protein. Contrast this to the heterotrimeric G proteins, which are coupled to G protein coupled receptors. RAS is just a single polypeptide which can have these two states, one in which it's in the on state and has guanosine triphosphate bound to it, and the other where it's in the off state and has guanosine diphosphate bound to it. Now let's say it's originally in the off state and therefore has guanosine diphosphate bound to it and isn't doing anything when it's in the off state. What is now going to happen is when the son of sevenness protein binds to the GRB2, it is now going to be activated to act as what is known as a guanine nucleotide exchange factor. So SOS, or son of sevenness, is going to act as a RAS, okay, a RAS protein, a guanine nucleotide exchange factor. Okay, so it's going to take that uh, GDP molecule off, okay, and then it's going to put a GTP molecule on instead, and therefore it's going to turn the RAS monomeric G protein from being in the off state to being in the on state. Now, guanine nucleotide exchange factors, for short, are often abbreviated to GEFs, okay? So G for guanine nucleotide, E for exchange, and F for factor. Okay, right. So, SOS is often called a ras GF, a ras guanine nucleotide exchange factor. So, what it will do is it will bind to the RAS monomeric G protein. Okay, and when it binds to the RAS monomeric G protein, this will make the bond between the RAS and the GDP much less strong. Okay, so the GDP can then fall off. Whereas before, when the RAS G protein was on its own, the bond between the RAS and the GDP was far too strong for it to break. So, the guanosine diphosphate was bound very strongly and therefore it couldn't get away. When the RAS binds, to the source, it weakens that interaction and the GDP can then fall off. Then what's going to happen is a guanosine triphosphate molecule from the cytoplasm is going to bind uh, in the site where the guanosine diphosphate was. Okay, now that will turn the RAS monomeric G protein on, basically, from the off state into the on state. And when it's now in the on state, it will cleave away from the son of sevenness protein and it will be uh, in wandering around on the underside of the phospholipid bi there. Okay, so this seems like a good place to have a break now, where we've now got the activation of our RAS monomeric G protein, um, and it's on the underside of the phospholipid bi there, so it's got this GTP bound, and it's now going to go off and activate downstream targets. Okay, right. Uh, the one final thing that I would just like to say is that there are different forms of RAS proteins, okay? So there are four main different forms of RAS protein. There is BRAS, okay? There is NRAS, okay? And there is KRAS4A and KRAS4B. Now, for our purposes, all of these forms of RAS uh, all do the same thing. They are all monomeric G proteins. They're all attached to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bi there via palmitoyl groups, okay? And they're all going to be activated by son of sevenless proteins, and they're all then going to go off to activate uh, RAF kinase enzymes, which we'll see in the next video.